Hi everyone, welcome to a brand new episode of the Behold Podcast on the Genre Equality Channel. This is Hitzer. I'm Isa. As always, like every year, we do a Halloween special here on Behold mm-hmm. um, to talk about horror stuff. Yep. Um, so we figured this year, what better way to talk about horror than with uh, one of the co- one of the creators of our own podcast. We have a <laughs> horror fiction podcast called Asian Nightmares. Um, it's created by a guy called Christopher Falk, a guy that we know very, very well. He is a playwright with Dark Matter Theatrics. He has written for television also with a television show called Soul Food, you know, um, and uh, among many other various projects that he's done. So we'll get into that with Chris Falk in just a bit. In addition, we'll be talking about some of Southeast Asia's best horror films uh, mm. in the, of the 21st century. Um, you know, um, Isa wants to talk about Shutter, which is um, something that scared us all back in secondary school oh, yeah. and polytechnic and all of that. <laughs> um, and I want to talk about two more recent indie art house horrors in Malaysia's Row and Indonesia's uh, Satan's Slaves. Mm-hmm. Uh, but first, let's kick it off by talking to the creator of Asian Nightmares, uh, a, a horror podcast here on the Genre Equality channel. All the links are down below so you can uh, you can click on it. You can listen to the first episode called The Water Cor- Corridor. It's up right now. Uh, welcome, Chris. How are you doing? Hi, Kids here. Hi, hi, Isa. Thanks for having me back. It's been a long time. Have we had you on for every Halloween podcast uh, episode in the last couple of years? I don't know. I can't remember. I think we might have, you know. Um, he wasn't on the last Halloween special, but he oh, was yeah. on the genre episode for Halloween because we, we talked about what we do in the Shadow Season 2. I remember oh, that yeah. one. Oh, yes, yes, yes. That's a fantastic show. Oh, yes, yes. And it is back for Halloween this year, by the way. So uh, we'll be talking about it on, on our next episode as well. But uh, we're here to talk with Chris first. For those of us who, who are not familiar with your work and where you come from and what you do, uh, maybe, maybe give us a little introduction into, into your background, Chris. Oh, um, well, I work, I consider myself primarily a writer. Uh, my mm-hmm. background comes from theatre, so we have, I have my own uh, theatre uh, collective. Uh, we're called Dark Matter Theatrics. Uh, mm-hmm. We were around since 2015. We've gone kind of, si- kind of silent in the past few years. Uh, oh, mainly COVID, because man. of COVID. And also... Yeah. Uh, but it's also because we all went in our different directions, kind to trying to search for stuff to m- make our creative juices, uh, kind of pump up. Uh, mainly because theater seemed to become even more uh, cloistered and a bit more restrictive mm. with a lot of the restrictions going up. So yeah, I primarily write a lot. Uh, my yeah. main thing right now is writing horror stories, which is I'm here. Absolutely, you're you're like one of the few like genre slash horror writers around in Singapore. Um, how did your love for for genre, specifically horror, begin? You know, did, did you start off writing horror straight away, or were you did you start with drama or something else? You know, well, I can tell you for a fact that my earliest memory of when I wanted to write a story was yeah. actually in primary school. So I had mm-hmm. this thing called. Uh, I used to, you know, those um, really old exercise books, right? I would yeah. use, I used to open them, uh, buy a blank copy, and then I would try to write my own stories. And I think, if I remember quite closely, the first one I wrote was a was something called the Scarlet uh, Letter, not referring to the <laughs> actual actual novel itself. But I thought it sounded mm-hmm. cool enough that uh, th- there was this supernatural uh, serial killer dropping off uh, scarlet letters to his yep. uh, intended victims. And I wrote a little short story about that. So I think wow. my love for horror kind of sprouted back up in the last few years. I mean, like, most of the time, uh, my inspiration comes from my from my dreams and mostly mm. the, the nightmares that I have. So uh, that kind of collectively made my brain quite, fucked up <laughs> so uh having horror like liking to watch horror once again kind of gave me a very external outlet to see mm-hmm. what sparks the imagination and i think uh ari aster's uh hereditary really kind of cemented that for me because i saw mm. uh, i recognized quite a lot of the fears going on in 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 that movie so yeah that's yeah why I want to write horror? 
I mean, Ari Aster is one of those guys that's kind of reinvigorated horror over the last um, five or six years, you know, with mm-hmm. Hereditary, as you mentioned, with Midsommar and all that. You know, and there's a lot of cool, deeper, more art house kind of horror going around, which is a, a different take on horror. And I can see how something like that can rejuvenate your juices, in particular because in the late 90s and the mid-2000s and all of that, horror had become a bit a bit stale, a bit cookie-cutter, you, you know what I mean, right? Yep, yep, yep. I yeah. Agree. Yeah, absolutely, and and you've written a bunch of like different um genre things as as well, right? You know, um, you you wrote for a TV show called Soul Food, am I right? Yep, uh, that was also horror. <laughs> that was also sense. horror, exactly. I mean, I mean, like portions of it was about horror as well, ghosts. Mm-hmm. Even though we're not supposed to write about ghosts, but yeah, so a uh, large, <laughs> uh, it was an interesting experiment uh, on my yeah. on my part. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I I realize I'm dig- digressing a bit. For for those who don't know, like, where can you watch it and what's it about? Uh, so, uh, Soul Food, uh, is I think an eight part, uh, series. You can find it on, um, what was? Oh my goodness, I can't believe I forgot the production house. Uh, Vitsi, Vitsi, Vitsi right? yes, Vitsi, yeah. Vitsi, yes. It's on Vitsi. It's free to watch. Uh, mm-hmm. it's about this, uh, psychologist turn food, uh. Food, um, re re. Um, oh my goodness! How how do you, how do you describe her, what her profession is? She basically does food investigate uh, investigation about mm-hmm. uh, lost cuisine, lost family cuisines that uh, these families have, and yep. she has a very strange relationship with the food and her manner in which she uh deciphers what the dish actually is and what it means to that to the to her client is a very interesting procedural in my in my part, uh understanding of it yeah i mean that that sounds like an awesome um premise right there it's it's available on vitsy right now if you have you know the internet uh you can go and watch it already mm-hmm. um and then you kind of transitioned on into audio dramas you know what made you interested in pursuing um a purely audio uh narrative platform um well i bef- i think when before covid hit um i got into um i got into um welcome to nightdale which was a very different brand of horror fiction yep. podcasting very satirical uh mm. and it's in and also quite absurd uh in yeah. the way it's a uh, way horror is portrayed so that really got me inspired but then i found no sleep podcast mm. and i spent the better part of last year listening to about a hundred over plus podcasts from no sleep <laughs> just one after the other while i was working because it really helped me uh keep awake during lunch so <laughs> and that's how that and i mean like as i listened like past like maybe 10 seasons i realized yeah. i could count on a uh, Count on one hand how many stories from Asia written in English that have an Asian reference uh, mm. from those that were being uh, played out uh, in, in No Sleep. And I found it, okay, it's very America-centric. I'm slightly sick of that. I want to hear yep. stories from our region. So, mm. and mm. I mean, like, I did my own little research and trying to find that on other podcast sites. And I found very little I, I found quite a lot of people telling ghost stories, right? Mm-hmm. But not in the narrative form. So mm. it, that inspired me to kind of take on the whole entire endeavor to, okay, I'm going to write something. It's going to be performable uh, in a very theatrical sense, uh, yep. but auditory. So that's how I got into Asian Nightmares. So this vacuum in in audio dramas or or horror podcasting, so to speak, um, that you know basically never really covered Southeast Asia is what led you into Asia Nightmares. Um, I, I mean that's obviously part of the genesis, right? Um, yep. well, what what else went into the what else inspired your your creation of Asia Nightmares? Um, I think it's it's theater. It was the yeah. it was the vacuum of theater, right? In, you had nothing to do there. I really had nothing to do, <laughs> in a sense. I mean, like, I can write plays, right? I can write yeah. scenes. But mm-hmm. if I am not seeing an actor perform it in a rehearsal room, then mm. what's the point, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and 
with the I mean like now restrictions are lessening, but this is uh, this was what filled the void and helped me uh, turn uh, make the most of my skills right mm. um, in the meantime. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you write a play in a forest and no one's there to perform it, does it exist? Uh, <laughs> um, so you, you, you got the idea for Asian Nightmares. You wanted to be a Southeast Asian centric uh, series of horror narratives. Um, your first episode called The Water Corridor, um, already out now on the Journal of Quality channel. You can you can listen to it on Bandcamp and, and Spotify and a few other places as well. Um, tell us, uh, how did you come up with the story and... and um, was it always meant to be this really intense uh, monologue, you know, uh, with with Lian performing it? Uh, well, I knew for a fact that the first episode uh, would be a monologue. It had to okay. be a monologue, mainly because that is one of the things I'm really great at. If you came to, if any of you uh, know some of my past work, when I did a Twisted Kingdom, that was an entire play in a monologue format. So it was something mm. familiar to me. I didn't want to, I didn't want to, uh, rewrite the, <laughs> rewrite the wheel. So yeah. Uh, and it also made sense that if I wanted to record it in during lockdown with such high restrictions, uh, mm. I think the best part, best way to do it would be to only have one single actor, right? So there wouldn't be so much inter, so much uh interaction and so much coordinating. And this was the first time I was doing it, so there had to be a monologue. Uh, mm -hmm. For those who don't know about the water corridor, I can just read to you a bit about the synopsis, right? It tells, yep, yep. It's, a, it's a monologue told from Ben's point of view, which mm -hmm. retells the childhood trauma that results in the disappearance of a family member and a okay. hidden walkway only accessed by rain. And I think uh, it took me a long time to come up with that synopsis because I need to like scrunch everything in. <laughs> the thing about horror and what makes it so difficult to write is suspense, right? Mm. Suspense is like the main blood pumping through a good horror film, right? Yeah. Whether it's about uh, red herrings, but not knowing where that jump scare is going to come out. But those things are, are visual, right? Mm -hmm. So how do I translate that into an experience uh, for the years? So that was, yeah. a, was a big part about how I kind of crafted it. What inspired me uh, mm -hmm. specifically about the water corridor was uh, a dream that I used to have about a corridor filled with water, and wow. that was one of the one of those dreams that when you wake up in the morning you just go like, Ugh, I need a shower <laughs> because I feel like I'm covered in sweat, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So that kind of um, that was just the the seed for the idea and then it just became this humongous 20 minute 30 minute thing <laughs> so <laughs> yeah 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 i think like uh lian sutton who obviously performed the monologue uh, did a fantastic job oh, yeah. uh as was like you know the the evocative uh writing on your part and the the production and sound design by our co-host here um isa fung which is uh where we're gonna take you now you know um isa obviously um helped produce the first episode and will help produce subsequent episodes um i'm assuming you know um isa you know from your um sound and music background you know um how did that play into the first time that you are doing a, a, a narrative uh fiction podcast you know was it um weird did you have uh, a learning curve or anything like, or anything like that um uh, i i think adapting this the kind of skill sets that that i've picked up kind of over yep. the years doing music being in bands and just like doing like audio design uh doing an audio podcast felt a, a bit different right like it's not you and me we sit down and then we talk and then mm. we clean up the audio after that um yep. there are things to be said about um the way things are paced which has a lot to do with you know the way that chris has already written it and then in addition to that the way that lian uh, performs it and his interpretation of, of what it, it's it's supposed to be and then when it comes to me uh, you know, a lot of it has to do with like checking back with Chris, like, okay, for this particular portion, is the pace right? You know, is the intonation right? Do we need to do another take here? Um, mm -hmm. Especially when we're in the studio, right? Needing to make some of these decisions kind of on the fly because we are not, you know, we, unlike when you're recording with a band, right? It's not like you're, you've booked out like a couple of months worth of sessions to 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 kind of like get everything down perfect. Um, mm -hmm. So that was kind of 
a, a bit of a learning curve, I think, um, mm-hmm. as well as working with the spoken, uh, with spoken word, right? Working with the human voice as it is, as it speaks, is kind of different because I, I don't think we've ever, you know, uh, in my personal experience, I've done any spoken word with audio behind. You've got to find a right balance in which what you are trying to evoke with the sound design um, is present in the audience's ear, but does not take over from the focus point, which is the voice, right? Where the which I ma- think you did a fantastic job, by the way. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 it took us a while. It took us a while, but I'm, I'm glad we kind of nailed it that way. Um, so, yeah, a lot of adapting, a lot of learning kind of new things uh, going mm-hmm. along the way. Um, and apparently from, from the things that Chris and I have discussed about his future episodes, uh, going to be constantly keeping me on my feet because I, I don't think uh, once we've tried something and, and we like it, we're not going to kind of repeat that anymore. <laughs> Right, right, yeah, right. So, so, um, yeah, it's gonna it's gonna be kind of fun. Um, moving forward with that, I've never really done foley and sound design in this mm-hmm. respect before. Um, so, yeah, it's been it's been a fascinating journey, kind of like learning techniques and 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 kind of discovering there. You know, I, I'm not in a studio like clapping wood together or anything of the sort, right? A lot of it now is digital. You just wait. You just wait. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we've had that conversation. Um, you know, but it, it's it's interesting to... I've done some sound design for like uh, audio visual work. I've done some design for short films as well. Um, yeah. But this is like an entirely different thing, right? Like the, the, the sound needs to create its own image within the audience's head and it has to mm. exist without the visual, you know, mm-hmm. um, and, and how do you kind of like appeal to that? How do you find something that's universal enough for everybody to kind of understand within yeah. within the oral realm um, mm-hmm. that that hits the, the feeling that you want to get or, or, or creates the image that you want to create? Um, so yeah, it's been it's been it's been really fun and been really kind of like challenging, um, you know, pushing pushing boundaries for for my own skill set. Nice, that. you know. Um, since you are like you know a collaborator on a project and you clearly have like you know more technical knowledge on the audio production realm, you know, mm-hmm. uh, do do you have any like questions for for Chris that that maybe like you know that flies over the casual head like mine? Oh, um, well, I I think um, I I spent a lot of time like you know listening to to the the podcast over and over again, right? So it it became at a point a bit diff I had to kind of divorce myself from it every time I, I, I gave a new draft and things like that. But yep. one of the things that occurred to me, and maybe not so much a technical question, is like okay. Chris, is there a special relationship that you kind of have with Rain, right? Is there something that maybe sparked off this particular dream that you had that made it so memorable? Uh because for me, like personally, a lot of the time I associate Rain here in Singapore, right? Tropical, mm-hmm. largely mm-hmm. sunny Singapore, we get it's either hot or rainy, right? Either yeah. one mm-hmm. of the two. Uh, I've always associated rain with more of, you know, the the uh, the respite that it brings, you know, mm-hmm. the, the fact that it's cooler and, and break from the heat and all of that. And working on working on water corridor sort of yeah. um, sort of took me away from that, right? Like it, it completely recontextualizes like someone's association with rain. So maybe you could share a bit about, you know, um like how you you felt you know this particular dream you had and maybe mm-hmm, how that mm-hmm. dream changed your your perspective on rain on your association with rain well um okay so i have the corner unit in my hb flat right mm-hmm. uh and on i look out we have this white set of windows uh in my room and when it rains uh and usually in singapore we uh, uh, in my part of singapore we get a lot of lightning strikes and sometimes that happens in the middle of the night, which means that uh, my whole entire house would trip. And because I'm a very light sleeper, uh, just like my dad, uh, I will get up immediately with, with that one thunderbolt. And it is a, a frantic scramble to the, to the kitchen, to the, to the circuit breaker to flip the switch back on again, right? Which is above the, above the fridge. So mm-hmm. there's a lot of anxiety and muddleness that happens when that happens. Mm. And every single time that happens, it is a thunderstorm. The the my image of the rain, my relationship with the rain, that motif, uh, is 
I used to think that it was calming, but living in this in this house, it's it, my associations with it are anxiety sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, uh, m- and it's always always a frantic scramble uh, to close windows when uh, when a thunderstorm comes on because uh, all of all of our windows don't face the corridor; it faces out. Uh, out of the block, so we get mm. wind and rain sometimes coming into uh into our house if we're not careful. So yeah, um, I think I just channeled all of that anxiety <laughs> into this particular story, uh, <laughs> with the motif of rain. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's a great okay. question. Thanks. Yeah, um, that's that's one of the questions I had, and I think if we want to talk about more technical things, right? Um, I've I've worked with you on a number of of um the theatre stuff that you've done, uh, mm-hmm. you know, and I I've kind of seen you as well as you know, kind of uh doing everything from you know the writing to directing to acting to to lighting, and things like that. Um, just a a question: How different do you find directing a performer like Lian, um, when when it's only uh, voice, right? When when it when all you have is, is kind of the voice thing. Like, when do you call for a line that needs to be read again, right? Because every person who performs it is going to do it slightly differently, you know. And you don't mm-hmm. exactly have the same kind of um visual feedback necessarily that you would get from an actor who is within a theater space or a rehearsal space, mm. you know. Mm. Uh, how how Basically, my question is: How different is it to to direct a performer, uh, within an audio only space? Um, f- fantastic question. Um, I don't think it's that much different. Um, sometimes, uh, and 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 I understand the the visual aspect when it comes to directing theater. Like that's important because. At the end of the day, they're going to deliver that line differently, night after night, performance after performance, mm-hmm. right? That's not something that you have so much control over. What you have control over on stage is blocking, right, mm-hmm. and uh, visual cues, right. Uh, but with audio, I think that's um, that's the thing that I kind of envy musicians about is because the that one take. You can redo it as many times as you want to get it cl- as close to the perfection that you want. So, but I think with um, with Lian, with him being such a wonderful actor, he mo- he mostly kind he he gets me. He gets he gets the way I write. Mm-hmm, so, mm-hmm. Uh, working with him wasn't too hard. But what was exciting about the experience recording with him was the manner in which how. Now words become a bit more centric, right? Uh, every pause uh, becomes even more uh, cavernous, mm. uh, in a sense. So, whenever there is an awkward pause in the text, uh, to me, uh, it's not. To me, it has to be intentional, yeah. right? Because mm. then we. Are recording it and it cannot change, right? <laughs> it cannot, it cannot change at all. Uh, one of the one of the ways that I learn writing as as well as directing is that after some sometimes when my actors are rehearsing a scene and I find it's getting stale, I'll close my eyes and mm. see that if the way that they are performing it is it because the words that they are saying are not in the beats that they are supposed to come out in mm-hmm. or is it because uh, of other factors and I find that that particular technique that I use in directing was very helpful in, in the recording space because at points of time when Lian was reading out the text um, whether I closed my eyes or not, that to me was so that was what was going to come out, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So um, and if you notice also, uh, while we were in, in the recording room, I didn't ask him to do too many takes about certain things. Yeah. Mainly because, like, for me, like, it's always, like, I take it from TV as well, right? Usually the mm. first take is the best sometimes, right? Mm-hmm. And with every repetition that the actor goes through in a certain section, um, tiredness might come out, uh, mm. out of their voice. So, yeah, I, I think that was the... 
it's not too different. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not too different from from theatre. Uh, I think, but it's just a much more attentive. There's much more attentiveness to uh, the innate beat of the of the text because there's a certain cadence in which I write sometimes as well. Mm-hmm. Mm, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to take a moment to shout out uh, our very dear Leonard to say at Snakewood Studios, who was our wonderful engineer, yeah, um, for Water Corridor and and hopefully for further projects. Um, if you guys are musicians or you need something audio recorded, uh, please check uh it out at snakewood.com. Um, you know, uh, Leonard is one of the most venerable uh um producers and 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 engineers we have here in Singapore with a wonderful space and three lovely cats, uh, that are simply adorable. If somewhat annoying sometimes, um, yeah. But shout out to Leonard and and Snakeweed, um, and 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 big thanks to to the part that they played in helping us make Water Corridor possible. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, of course, you know, we're winding down in our interview, so we got to look to the future, right? You know, um, what's coming up with Asian Nightmares? Do you have you know your ideas for future episodes or even future seasons uh, lined up for you, Chris? Uh, yeah. So I am currently working on uh, a new story. Mm. Um, I've already written finish one. Uh, then th- that will be the season finale story because I couldn't keep my hands from writing it. <laughs> yeah. Right? So, uh, but the other one is about maybe seventy to eighty percent done. Uh, mm. I just have a bit more to go before uh it's ready for rehearsal and then recording. Um, uh, that one's a bit different. It doesn't even have a title yet. Uh, but mm. it revolves around the disappearance of a wheelchair-bound girl in the Genting Highlands, so mm. in Malaysia. And this, but the whole entire story takes takes place in Singapore. So, but yeah. I, I mean, like, I, I, I like that because the the having it be in Asia somehow makes it so much more comforting uh, mm-hmm. and also much more freaky, according to some of the listeners. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, why do you think it is, you know, that, that Asian horror seems to inspire that much more fear than, say, Western horror? Uh, I mm. think... Uh, okay, this is a theory that I have about Western horror. No offense to people who watch Western horror. We all watch Western horror. We can't run away from it. But mm-hmm. I, have, I have the very biased notion that their ghosts are not vicious enough. Our mm. ghosts are much more vicious mm-hmm. <laughs> and mm. resentful. Um, and I think uh, also because our culture doesn't completely make us secular sometimes, right? Mm. So, uh, and, and all of these holidays that we, we celebrate here in Singapore, all of it comes with a lot of cultural baggage and a lot of folklore mm-hmm. is associated with it as well. Come on, we, we celebrate Hungry Ghost Festival, which is as... It's not even to me. It's not the same as the festival of death in uh, Mexico, right? Yep. It's not the same. That one is like celebrating an, uh, ancestors in a very nice and cheery way. But over here in uh, in Asia, there's a very morose and grim mm. feel to it. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, it's 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 not cocoa. Yeah. It's not cocoa. It's definitely not cocoa. <laughs> yeah. right? If cocoa came to Singapore, <laughs> yeah. it would be terrifying. It would be the eighteen yeah. levels yeah. of hell. We have we don't have one. We have eighteen. Mm-hmm. So uh, in the Chinese uh, Buddhist sense, right? So yeah. yeah, that's that's my that's my theory. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I kind of have like kind of similar thoughts to you as well with with Asian horror. I, I, I sometimes I think it's also part of an innate. Um, bias, uh, because fear is a very intimate thing and mm. it's very culturally based. So maybe, you know, something from the East doesn't um, scare someone from the West as much and vice versa, uh, you know. So maybe that could be a part of it as well. Um, yeah, um, a- any any last questions from you, Isa, before we let Chris go? Uh, no, I think that, that sums it up um, pretty uh, pretty handily. Um, Chris, do you want to um, kind of like shout out where, where people can find you Yeah. Uh, and your other work besides Asian Nightmares of which we will have all the links uh, associated um, mm-hmm. in, in our description in Mixcloud or in Spotify or in YouTube? Uh, well, I mean like all of what you just mentioned you can find Asian Nightmares on. Uh, I think uh, from 
what I've noticed from our from the data that we've gotten, uh, most people like to w- listen to it on Spotify. So uh, mm-hmm. that's uh, mo- one of the more more accessible options. Mm-hmm. Um, other work that is coming up, nope, nothing. That's this is all I'm gonna do for the rest <laughs> of the year. Yeah. yeah. That, that's awesome, Chris. Uh, thanks so much for giving us uh, your time uh, and, and effort. And, and I honestly, you know, coming from a non-collaborative standpoint, because I have no association whatsoever with, um, with Asian Nightmares, so I can say this like objectively, you know, I super enjoyed the first episode. Uh, can't wait to see um, what you and Isa come up with next. You know? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. Uh, goodbye, Chris. Bye. Bye. And now we're going to get into some of uh, Southeast Asia's best horror films, specifically from the 21st century. Um, if we were to open it up, you know, to all of time, uh, since the beginning of cinema, I think Southeast Asian horror has been one of the most uh, successful genres, I think, in our film industry. Mm-hmm. Um, going yeah. all the way back to, you know, like the early days in the 40s, you know, with the Pontianak movies and yeah. stuff like that. It's been one of our bread and butter cornerstones, uh, you know, besides yeah. musicals and stuff like that. You mm-hmm. know, this is a, a, a very uniquely Asian, Southeast Asian thing with our own folklore. And I think that's why it kind of grips, I mean, we if you don't know, we come from Singapore, so it, it grips our imagination more so uh, than, say, a, a, a Midsommar or a, whatever else comes from the West, right? You yeah. Know? Um, so we're here to talk about three of the best uh, of the 21st century, in our opinions. You know, they come from Malaysia, they come from Indonesia, they come from Thailand. Um, we, I kind of wanted to pick a Singapore thing, but we already talked to a Singapore writer, so, you know, I think we've represented us enough. <laughs> uh, let's, let's go around the region and, and begin with a movie from Indonesia, Yep. Uh, from one of the best horror directors of the modern era, in my opinion, not just from this region, yeah, but from from around the world, Joko Anwar, um, who routinely gets nominated uh, by Indonesia for the Oscars in the best foreign film category. You know, mm-hmm. like every couple of years, he comes up with like a, a huge, uh, at least domestically, like, a huge uh, horror film that yep. blows the box office, gets critical acclaim. Most recently, he did in Petigor. Mm. Uh, but I, I'm here to talk about the film that really broke him out into the spotlight. It's called Penghabli Satan, or as it's known to English-speaking audiences, Satan's Slaves. Um, if you've not seen Satan's Slaves, it's, uh, it's a 2018 film um, that is uh, one of the best Southeast Asian horror movies in recent memory, and it was shown at like you know, SGIFF. It had a lot of critical acclaim in the festival circuit, which is very unusual for mm-hmm. horror movies here. Yeah. Um, but I think it kind of goes in line with the whole art house direction that a lot of horror has gone into uh, recently. Um, the plot centers around uh, Rini, um, a, a maybe or maybe not doomed family on the outskirts of Jakarta. Um, the mother is bedridden by a mystery disease that makes her look vaguely like a ghost. Um, the father's monetary situation barely covers monthly bills. Um, Rini and her brother Tony uh, keep little brothers Bondi and, and Ian in line. Um, Ian is a mute who only communicates through sign language. Mm-hmm. Um, day and night, you know, the, the mother rings her bell, uh, you know, that, 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 that beckons whenever aid is required, uh, but not without a constant creep factor that begins to rule over Rini's family. Um, it, is her once successful musician mother medically sick? Or are there malevolent supernatural puppeteers trying to destroy this otherwise, you know, um, wholesome slash struggling family unit? Yeah. Um, spoiler alert, it's, it's probably the latter. <laughs> um, and, 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 and Satan's uh, Slaves doesn't hesitate to establish itself as, you know, an immersive uh, past bedtime a nightmare fuel. You know, Joko Anwar really knows how to scare you, um, oh, expected yeah, yeah. or not. Um, and it's done through very simple uh, but sadistic suspense thriller motions, you know. Um, it's it's kind of, uh, it has great cinematography. Mm. It has uh, great pacing and, and fantastic acting and actually really good music as well. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's expect, you know, nothing short of, it, this is nothing like the kind of lazy, horror that we've been getting in the 90s and 2000s, especially around our region, you know, which is just full of jump scares and stuff. Yeah. You know, this, this is more in line with uh, the, the 
of a movement that A twenty four has started like, with with art house horror. Mm. Um, you you have not seen uh, Satan's Slaves back when it came out in cinemas. And, no, no. Uh, I, I I recently linked you to the film. Uh, what, what what do you think about it? Oh man, um, really Satan Slaves. Especially, I think what really, really caught me was just kind of like the opening sequence, right? Or, or the opening scene really looks like something that would be on A24 Slate, right? Mm-hmm. Like, it it had, you know, all the look and the color and the feel, uh, you know, the, the the period costuming from the 80s with the um, the set design and all of that. Like, cinematography, like, all of that, like, A+, right? Like, mm-hmm. it could easily, you know, be on it. Uh, it could be easily up there with everything that um, the A twenty four is doing. Is doing. Yeah. At the moment, you know. So I think it kind of it caught me off guard. Uh, when I was watching, I was like, "Oh wow, right?" Like you, you've been raving about Satan Slaves since you caught it at SGFF. Yeah. Uh, back right? in twenty eighteen. Yeah. Um, back in twenty eighteen, and like it comes up every once in a while whenever we're 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 kind of doing like horror stuff. Um, yep. so like, man, I, I missed out. I missed out for the last two years because it is really, really good and really, really terrifying in parts. Mm-hmm. Uh, all, I mean, it's not a perfect film and we'll, we'll get into kind of the yep. integrity of that later on, but like very impressed. Um, mm-hmm. my first impression was being like really impressed essentially, right? Just with the look of it and as the story kind of continues and the suspense kind of builds from there you know like Joko doesn't play around like he really doesn't play around right like he hooks you in you know with the the the, the amazing kind of cast and, and the great looking set and all the very aesthetically pleasing colours and then when it all turns to shit and you're getting you know getting scared of your out of your seat you know like he he, he does that s- transition so naturally and so smoothly mm. it really does make it feel I, I think especially with the slate of films that, that we're discussing today you know that somehow Asian horror feels a lot closer to home right mm. like the supernatural feels very much more adjacent to the world that we live in than you know my personal kind of like perspective on like western horror for example mm-hmm yeah, so solid, solid stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, I I totally understand why you've been raving about it for so long, mm. uh, and I highly encourage anyone who has not checked it out. And if you're a big fan of horror, not just like Asian specific horror, but like horror and kind of the new wave of horror that we've been getting, like Satan Slaves, definitely is up there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, if you're not aware, Satan Slaves is actually a remake of a very successful um. Indonesian horror classic from 1982 by a guy called Siswaro uh, Guatama Putra. You know, and, and Joko Ano has kind of revitalized that forgotten horror classic uh, and made it something his own. You know, he's given it a more atmospheric, a more creepy, a less uh, jump scary slash campy vibe. You know, mm-hmm. it's it's a bit similar to how uh, Luca Giudacchino um, adapted Suspiria, you know, mm. rather than the 80s Jello horror version. So it's a, it's a bit more in that vein, you know. Um, and it's, as far as Asian horror goes, Satan Sleeves is not the quote unquote uh, most scariest of the of of the pack, you, oh, you know no. what I mean? Yeah. It it it's more of a, a psychological slow burning um kind of vibe with with thematic depth, you know. Uh, and but it's 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 quite a good deal scary also. It's like don't don't get me wrong, like, yeah. you know. And um, it looks fantastic. I think I think Joko Anwar can make a dollar look like ten on on mm. on big screen. You know, um, the acting is great quite across the board. Um, there's even some wicked humor to be found in the film, which yeah. is which is pretty good. Um, he's not afraid to you know kick at boundaries here and there. Um, there are some homages to the original if you've seen it. Um, and and th- this the this all make a, a very enjoyable um film you know like even if you're not one that scares easily i think like it's a good uh drama on the surface of it it's, it's a good horror as well you know um what are the, some of the uh specific aspects about uh satan slaves that that caught your eye oh um are we talking like about the aesthetics or kind of like specific scenes or... you know um let, let, let's begin with the story and then we'll talk about aesthetics and and then our favorite scenes you know yeah uh this this entire kind of idea of of making a a, a pact with the devil right yeah um is i feel oh, well okay with my limited knowledge of kind of like our supernatural folklore 
generally in Southeast Asia, right? And maybe mm-hmm. even less so uh, in, in, in Indonesia. Like, that to me feels... Like, if you were to read the premise of Satan's Slave to me, um, kind of, like, before I watched the film, it's just, it's, oh, you know, Pack with the Devil, that sounds like a kind of, like, a very Western-ish thing, mm-hmm. right? Like, you make a Pack with the Devil. Um, you know, but there is something extremely distinctly not Western about this, right? I feel like the 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 Indonesian or or wow, how do I even place this culturally? Right, there is a a version of Satan, right, mm-hmm. in this in this film that is very foreign to I think what people would think of a uh... Judeo Christian Satan. Yeah, um, but, but more Catholic centric horror that the Exorcist kind of spawned, right? It's yeah, very different from that. Like, yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's extremely different from that, right? Like it is not as, I don't know, not as well defined, right? And in that kind of like ambiguity, it is more terrifying because you don't have like a ton of literature about like what that actually means, right? When you make a pact with the devil, uh, mm-hmm. necessarily, right? It's more like a monkey's paw situation. Mm. You know where where you got to be really careful what you wish for, uh, uh. You know to 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 reference another kind of like uh, uh Asian a, uh Asian supernatural pack, um. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that was kind of something that really kind of stood out to me. Uh, I I think Joko Anwar is very. It's not that he is avoiding right the idea of a you know a Judeo Christian devil. Uh, mm-hmm. or any sort of portrayals of that. I don't think he at any point in time there's any like intentional uh, move away from that. Uh, but he, he allows the story to be what it is within its context without alluding to that necessarily. Uh, and and I, I just thought that was very, very interesting, right? Like it's not something that we get that often at all. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, as you mentioned, you know, like like most Asian countries, Indonesia is a far more spiritual place than America or a lot of Western places where other horrors meet. I think a meaning that characters are more quickly ex- accepting of a supernatural threat. Yeah. Um, one of the things that are like kind of annoys me about uh, like Western horror is the kind of like um hemming and hawing. It would be like, oh, is this supernatural? Is it not? Is it you know, blah, blah blah? You know, I I kind of just want char- the characters to just ac- accept what they're dealing with and then so like get into the scares. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You know, like, like we got there's... entire episodes of that from uh, Midnight Mass, right? Mm-hmm. The whole cynicism science side of things. Which... Yeah, yeah, but but that kind of is the theme of the show, la, so I can get past it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it's a common feature in a lot of like Western horror. Agreed. I, I, exactly, and and. With the with the plus side of like the main character, um, Rini, right? That's her name. Yeah. Uh, I haven't seen it in a while, so yeah, I kind of forgot. It. Rini is also one of those like skeptics, you know, on the flip yep. side. So, you know, so so I kind of identify with her as well because she goes about it, um, you know, sort of semi believing. Yeah. But she grows up in a culture that really believes. So I kind of like I identified with her on on several levels, you know, mm-hmm. um, because how she went about the threat is interesting and. And, and relatable to me. Yeah. Um, you know, like the in the end there's this like practical realization that the satanic cult is is on route and, and there are far bigger threats than just the ghosts in the house, which is cool as well. Um in terms of aesthetics, right? Well, what do you love most about it? Oh man, I love the color palette. Mm. I really love the color palette. Like it had very um uh earth vibes. Right, like you know, kind of like the Jordan building, and like in addition to that, there's some I I don't know what it is, particularly about the eighties and the way that it's portrayed in a lot of indie films that has a charm to it. That I mean, obviously, I was not necessarily a part of, right? Having grow, uh, having been born in the late eighties mm-hmm. uh, itself, uh, I I think a lot of the 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 shots and the cin- cinematographic choices are, are just like very beautiful and very scenic when we get outdoor stuff uh the indoor stuff is just like very well framed you know and it captures like a sense of the space and like when you when as someone who pays attention to that right if if you are the kind that kind of pays attention to like the interior spaces in a film and you start Mm. to notice things that breeds a kind of familiarity with it that heightens the horror when something terrifying takes place within that space Right, mm. like there are a lot of very mundane moments that are captured within the house, 
uh, that I feel um, establish a, a, a what it it establishes a norm which with Joko can then build upon to create moments of suspense and horror and terror, right? Mm. As a you know, home being kind of like a, a, a place of refuge, uh, of, of normalcy, and then to have the supernatural kind of oh no, the, I'm saying okay, let me rephrase that because it might be spoilery. Um, yeah, you know, for that to kind of like uh inhabit or invade that space, right? Uh, really does like you know, it does heighten the the kind of horror that you can experience. Yes, yes, you know, I think cinema, the cinematographer Ikal Tanjung and Anwa are very fond of, like, long, broody gazes. <laughs> yeah. um, I think such sequences, um, especially back in 2017, 2018, when this was released, you know, can be a gamble for audiences who are not um, used to that style, yeah. that, that kind of art house style in, in horror filmmaking. And, mm-hmm. you know, this, this fixed lenses without tension. Yeah. But I think um, the, the framing unlocks, you know, like, situa- situational panic you know like yeah. you have you watch you know children left standing at a door that slowly creaks open um witchy undead hands reaching through you know the a, a sliver of an opening um you know um it's it's all very uh tense uh more tense than jump scary yeah uh there, but there are jump scares in in the, in the movie don't get me wrong you know like they i think they strike a perfect balance between the suspense and the jump scares mm-hmm. uh but i think the cinematography is is great um, I think like the, just just visually like the the palette was very different at that time from what you got from Southeast Asian horror. Um, what do you think about the acting? I thought like the the lead actress, uh, man, what was her name? Taro, Tara, yeah, Ta- Tara Basro, yeah, yeah. Tara Basro, th- amazing. She's. So I thought good. she was. I thought she was great. She played a very, very human character. She wasn't a caricature or, or an archetype of any sort. You know, you really got into the emotion of a story uh, as well as the family. Yeah. Um, yeah, I thought the acting um, overall was was outstanding and on point. What do you think? Yeah, I, I mean, like, it, the main thing that caught me about the acting, right, is how believable a family dynamic they had. Mm-hmm. Right, that felt very, like, it felt very lived in, right? Like, you you are watching an actual family go through all that. I, uh, definitely, Tara Basro solid solid thing also oh what's the kid's name uh Muhammad Adiyad the who yep. plays Yan yep oh man man like so adorable for most of the film mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> uh yeah um but just in general I feel like I oh, mean they acted their hearts out really you know and uh, I mean I'm not big on Indonesian cinema right yep. I'm not familiar at all with these names to me they are fresh faces uh, and uh, I was pretty blown away, you know, uh, by just like kind of the nuance that they work into that. Like when, you know, just as we talked about the cinematography, when you have a lot of these long, still brooding shots, right? A lot of it boils down to the actor's ability to portray emotion within mm-hmm. those scenes. And I think they did a great job. Yeah, you know, um, Joko Anwar to me is a bit like uh, it's weird to say uh, this because James Wan is Asian, but he's like the Asian James Wan. Yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, but, but James Wan is American, like he was born in America, so you know, there's kind of a different vibe there. But they kind of play with the same ideas, like the haunted house tropes and everything. Yeah, uh, just just with very different cultural contexts, which I think is really cool. You know, um, Indonesian cinema recently, especially in the last five or six years, has really gotten a bit of a boost because Satan Slaves got a big, uh, got a big play in America. Yeah. Um, it became a bit of a minor, uh, festival hit over there. Um, and of course, you know, like the raid movies have really opened uh people's eyes to Indonesian cinema as well from from the action standpoint. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a lot of great stuff going on in in the region, specifically in Indonesia, which is one of the biggest uh cinematic markets in Southeast Asia, probably the biggest, right? Yeah. I mean, just size, by yeah, sheer size, yeah. Definitely, yeah, which explains like how much money this made, like this and this launch Joko Anwar into the stratosphere, you know. Um before we move on to uh our next topic, you know, any final thoughts about uh Satan Slaves before we uh get into role? Oh man, uh please if you haven't checked it out, give it a shot. If you're a huge fan of what A twenty four is doing, like Satan Slaves is right up your alley. Yeah. Uh you know, again, it's not the most terrifying, not the most horrifying, but it's so well made. Mm-hmm. Right, and so specific in its telling that it is extremely charming as yep. as much as a horror film can be charming. Yes. Um, yeah, highly recommend. Highly recommend. 
Yeah, you know, I, I will say the ending has its issues, uh, as I think you would agree. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. But I think, you know, for the most part, this is this is an excellent film and a great uh, gateway drug into what Joko Anwar is all about. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, the, the ending notwithstanding. Yeah. Next up, let's move on from Indonesia to Malaysia to talk about another film I watched at SJFF, this time in 2019. Uh-huh. It's called Ro, uh, R-O-H. Uh, Ro in Malay means soul. Um, the re- I think the reason that they didn't rename it, especially in 2019, right? Yeah. Like in America, to Soul was because there was another really big movie called Soul uh, from Pixar that came out that year. Uh, oh. So they, co- they couldn't right. call it Soul. Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. It would have been completely eclipsed if they had done that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah. But this was a, a very masterfully minimalist folk horror from Malaysia uh, from a director called Emir Aswan. Um, whose whose directorial debut here goes you know heavy on atmosphere and symbolism, mm-hmm. uh, and, and marks another high point for Southeast Asian horror. Uh, it comes to you from micro budget production house Kuman Pictures. Um, in my opinion, because I I've recently gotten into the stuff that Kuman Pictures have made, and they've kind of been a breath of fresh air in Malaysian horror in recent years. You know, mm-hmm. um, back in twenty nineteen as well, um, a, a film called Two Sisters came out. Um, and and the studio proved that it's it has a very Blumhouse thing. It has a very like cost effective. Yeah. creatively challenging ethos uh, that proved that it could produce interesting alternatives to a genre indonated, uh, especially in our region, by like schlocky, jump scare driven efforts. Uh, and, and nowhere is that more evident than the second picture from, uh, from, from Kuman called Ro. Yeah. Um, it made as Mark, actually, as Malaysia's official submission for the 93rd Academy Awards in the Best International Film, Feature Film category. Um, it was filmed in just two weeks on a tiny budget of RM 360,000 uh, in the Denkil Forest of Slango. Um, it is a thematically rich, slow-burning folk horror, um, again, in the vein of Robert Eggers' The Witch. Mm. Um, it is set in an indeterminate past. Uh, Ro follows an isolated family living in a barren hut deep in the jungle. Um, quickly, we gather that the single mother there, played by Farah Ahmad, is distrustful of outsiders and prefers to raise her son, Anga, and her daughter, uh, Along, in seclusion. Uh, one day, their simple life is upended when they decide to take in a mud-caked little girl uh, lost in a forest. Um, after they clothe her, clean her, and feed her, the child suddenly prophesizes that they will all die by the next full moon before slitting her own throat. Uh, oof, not a very gracious guest. Um, the spooked and shaken family is soon beset by a frightening series of supernatural misfortunes, mm-hmm. uh, punctuated by visits from two other strangers. One is a kindly shaman healer uh, offering assistance, while the other is an imposing spear-wielding hunter who is tracking the mysterious child. Um, the family and the audience is at first unsure of who to trust, which kind of plays into, I think, Rose's themes of paranoia and pride and this primordial human instinct that un- anything unfamiliar in the wild, seen or unseen, is a potential threat. Yeah. Um, what do you think about Ro uh, now that you've seen it? Oh, man. Uh, first off, I'm going to say, for me, personally, mm-hmm. horror that involves kids is hard to watch. It yep. really, really is hard to watch. I-, I think that was one of the reasons why Hereditary hit so hard for me, was the yeah. involvement of, of having uh, you know, um, children in the story. And mm. uh, uh, Ro was the same way, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and again, you know, I mean, I, 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 I was born in Malaysia. Um, I grew yep. up mostly in Singapore, but I have spent a lot of time in Malaysia. Um, some of the things that, that, you know, they kind of reference are things that you hear, you know, kind of as a kid, right? Growing up, uh, maybe not so much in our generation as from our parents, as much as it like things that kind of get passed down, you know, among your schoolmates, or mm. you know, if you take uh like me, you take a you 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 take an interest in kind of like um Southeast Asian cinema, and then you get to watch stuff like um what's it called orang uh minya, right? And yep. all like the classic classic like forty fifties um you know Malayan cinema, uh Malayan mm. horror that came out from that area. So Rose struck me as very it was a singular experience because it felt very much like those movies, right? There was something about the look, uh of the film itself that felt extremely Malayan um, mm. that I can't like I can't quite put my finger on 
you know, especially the, the outdoor shots, right? Like that that take place, you know, like in within the forest itself, right? There's something distinctly Malayan about it. Like it has to be from this region. And I don't know if it's the flora, if it's the fauna, if it's the way that they kind of like chose to gr- color grade the light <clears throat> and, and all of that. But it's yep. really distinctly from, you know, our region. And therefore makes it... You, it makes it terrifying because, like, we could very well, you know, like, there, there's a forest not too far from anybody's house, right? And it mm-hmm. could take place there, right? You, you, there's the opportunity for the supernatural to occur within, you know, a stone throw away from you is entirely possible. Um, yeah, And that's just from the fact that, like, th- that's just the general vibe of it, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, for it not to be set in a specific time as well, uh, and to have it completely cut off from general civilization for whatever time it's supposed to be in, right, heightens the sense of isolation that you experience as an audience because you have no context outside of the actual narrative of the story itself. Yes, R- yes, yeah. And, I think like, yeah. oh, sorry, go, go ahead, continue. Yeah, and, and that isolation, again, kind of plays up the how harrowing um the 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 horror is when it comes up eventually right like every bit of uncertainty is multiplied because mm. there is no one else to turn to within this space yeah um, mm. yeah yeah i think um the movie is very light on plot and dialogue mm. uh but very heavy on symbolism and metaphor and yeah. i think like Emir as one does a fantastic job of, as you said, like crafting ominous imagery from the film's natural surroundings, natural yeah. surroundings that are very familiar to us. The director and his cinematographer, uh, Saifuddin Musa, kind of envelop viewers in a sense of like desolate isolation, um, kind of subtly compelling the idea that this is, there's a presence or a person or a creature or something that's behind the foliage, you know. Um, and, and the effect is greatly aided by by the foreboding score as well. Mm. I think Road, similar to Satan's Slaves, kind of as, uh, like avoids cheap scares to to meticulously craft this thick atmosphere of suspense, yeah. which makes the occasions when the film does choose to frighten you with brutally unsettling or gory sequences all the more haunting or all the more horrific. Um, Road, perhaps a bit more than the other films that we're talking about, kind of preys upon very deep-rooted superstitious fears, yeah. you know, of, of falling victim to sinister influences. Mm-hmm. Um, there is this opening quotation of a Quranic verse about the crafty nature of Satan's evil. Uh, it's the kind of closest the film comes to spelling anything out for you. Yeah. Um, instead, Emil kind, kind of relies on recurring religious motifs of fire and clay and blood, um, there are like, you know, this imagery of like burning trees and charcoal that is the family subsistence, right? And the characters are constantly covered in mud. Mm. Uh, so there's copious amounts of, of spilled blood. Um, the ways that Emir uses this kind of tableau of brown and red amid the, amid the green of the foliage it's kind of signifies the, the inescapable intertwining between, between danger and life. And then it offers you the mm-hmm. visual cru- clu- cu- cues or clues needed to decipher this this film yeah i think casual, casual horror fans looking for um faster pacing or more visceral trills may not necessarily enjoy rules ambiguous allegories yeah uh i think nevertheless do like if you are into you know more subtly layered or dread laden or minimalist horror that lingers in your mind uh long after the credits have rolled uh row is probably the one for you yeah yeah, I, I will add to the kind of point. I think Ro is very visceral in a very different way, right? Mm. Uh, the film has a copious amount of kind of these close-up shots of hands touching yep. things, uh, uh, you know, caressing things, holding things, hands covered in mud, hands covered in blood, hands, you know, stroking the fur of an animal, holding, holding the feathers of a bird. Uh, and like there is a materiality, like a heavy materiality to the film uh, mm. that you get the sense of uh, with, with the small moments of contact, like physical contact um, the, the characters have with the world around them. 
And that yep. in itself is a different kind of visceral, right? Like it's not a visceral gore necessarily, but mm-hmm. it drives home that, you know, once again, the supernatural is much closer to you than you think, than yep. you might think, right? And, and, and again, right, that inspires it, its own kind of terror. Yep, 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 definitely, you know. Um, any final thoughts about Ro before we move on to um, a certified, like, horror classic from Southeast Asia? Yeah, uh, it's, it's, been a, it's been a rough week for me yeah. watching all this horror uh, kind of like, well, within this kind of last two weeks. I'm going to say mm-hmm. that Ro and Satan's Slaves are in particular of the three that we've kind of watched. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I definitely needed a palate cleanser after watching these films uh, mm. because like you said, they linger on the mind, right? Like, there's something about the combination of the the aesthetic of it, whether or not it's the kind of, like, um, whether it's Joko Anwar's kind of, like, you know, beautiful, like, colour palette and eclectic furnishings that stays with you and therefore the association of the, of the, the, the scare stays with you. Or whether mm. it's, like, this... Maybe, maybe it's just, like, PTSD from spending a lot of time out in the jungle during NS... You know, yeah, um, could be. You, you know, but that that <laughs> uh, in role especially, right, and and just the 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 sense of of the material things that are there that are, are you know familiar to to some of us maybe um, mm-hmm. that that lingered on the mind that I really needed to get out of my system because I knew that it would probably feed into my dreams. And mm-hmm. that to me is a benchmark of amazing horror. When like two or three days days later, right, you know, something flashes in your head from the movie, right, and it evokes the same feeling while you were watching it, right. I mean, all good cinema is right, but for horror in particular, uh, because it's something I do think a lot of the time we try and put out of our mind after the actual experience of watching it. Yep. Um, and and these two films, oh man, I got large doses of that. Oh yeah, definitely, man. Um, we're kind of moving on now from the more um, art house driven horror yes. to something that was super mainstream back in the early 2000s in the early aughts. Um, this is kind of considered um, Thailand's response to the J-horror craze, if you all remember, in the yeah. late 90s and early 2000s. Um, Shutter made a massive splash at the box office in its native country, um, especially in Singapore. I remember everyone talking about this back yep. in the day. Yep. Um, it, it even became like a kind of a cult hit in, in North America. So it kind of went everywhere, you know, and, and it's uh, part of it is because the J-horror was so big and this film borrows so much from J-horror. Yep. Um, it is... Shutter. It is the feature debut by uh, Park Poom, uh, Wong Poom and Banjong uh, Pisantanukun. Um, I definitely butchered your names, I'm sorry. Um, the, the plot revolves around a photographer named Toon and his girlfriend Jane. They are a happy couple in love uh, and they open up the doors to a supernatural torrent when a distracted Jane accidentally runs over a woman mm-hmm. while driving home from a friend's wedding. Um, Toon, who has been drinking, convinces Jane to flee uh, in a hit and run, leaving the woman alone in the middle of the road. Uh, Subsequently, strange images begin showing up in Toon's photography and spooky things start happening to the couple. Um, The obvious thing is that their wrongdoing um, is kind of prompted by justice and punishment from beyond the grave. But the narrative takes its time in unraveling a very different shocking truth um, the story's, I think, structure and character work is the thing that really sets Shutter apart. Mm-hmm. Um, and the twist at the end, uh, not just the not just the end end twist, but the story twist about what actually inspired the ghost, what prompted her on this reign of vengeance, uh, was a very shocking thing that I, I kind of didn't see coming at all because yeah. the 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 film really uh hit that um hit that twist really really well and laid out a lot of cool red herrings along the way. Mm. Um I think that's why kind of uh Shutter became such a such a big hit back in the early two thousands. Now granted like uh we have we're not as young as, as anymore. Yeah. We, we we watched <laughs> this film when we were very young, you know, when we were in our teens, our either secondary school or polytechnic or, or JC, you know, that kind of age. Yeah. Um, and you know, we were a bit more impressionable then. La. Um, watching it from a more adult uh POV, uh, where my horror palette has a bit has matured quite a bit since then, you know, like I would say Shutter doesn't quite hold up, you know. So yeah. um you do have to go back to like a more uh innocent 
age uh, to remember like what scared you about this, you know. And going back to that era, uh, going back to when we were young, you know, what was the thing that 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 stuck shutter in your mind? Um. Okay, so again, right? It was it was at the period of time where we, where J horror and and to some extent K horror, right, was kind of mm-hmm. like taking root and and gaining sort of like global recognition for the work that they were doing there, right? So you had anything from, ooh, okay, I don't want to name anything off the top of my head just in case I get the the kind of like the dates wrong for that. Um, but yeah, Shutter kind of following but... in the in the footsteps of of all of that. Uh, Ringu, um, you know, um, stuff like that. Yeah, Juon and Juon, yeah, yeah, all of that, all of which eventually got really, really shitty Hollywood yeah. adaptations. Yeah, which Shutter did as well. Um, mm-hmm. but there was something about um, I, I okay, I think Shutter is important because it was very zeitgeist for Southeast Asia at that point in time, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, not only in the fact that it was one of the first few. Southeast Asian films to get like solid international recognition, despite the fact that it was definitely riding on the coattails of, of J Horror at the time. Uh, yeah. it it put us it put Thailand on the map, right? Thai horror on the map. And Thailand has gone on to make several other like mm. you know amazing kind of horror films that maybe someday we'll get to um as well. Uh but I feel like there was um, something to do with like the matter of pride that I felt as a Southeast Asian, right? I can't speak for everybody about like watching a film that I at that age did find truly psychologically terrifying. Uh, mm. you know, with the way that it went. I I feel like the, a lot of it hinges on the twist, uh, the story mm. twist itself. Um in that, you know, kind of like the age-old horror trope that, you know, the monsters aren't out there, la, right? Mm. Uh, as much as they are in here. Um, you know, uh, and to have all of that package into one kind of thing and also come out at a time in which Southeast Asia's uh, film industry was fighting for a chance at global recognition, yeah. uh, you know, felt feels like Shutter was a very kind of like important milestone in that. You know, uh, I agree with you. It has not aged well. Um, Simply because just of the sheer quality of horror that we're getting these days, right? Mm. It does look dated. It does feel dated. There are, it still leans onto a lot of the cliches of that particular era, right? Or even the era before it. Um, Mm. But I'm rewatching this very recently. There are moments of kind of like, small brilliance right there that you you're like oh right you know like that's something that sure they might have copied it from somewhere but it was unique and, and specific to this film and i remember that you know like uh, some of the mirror things that they did not new at all right mm-hmm. but new for southeast asian horror uh and left an impression on me because at that point in time like again hadn't watched that many horror movies to identify where that necessarily mm-hmm. came from um, yeah. You know, and the kind of like small budget that they had uh, and ambition that this film had was just like kind of off the rocks. And I continue to be impressed reading stories about that to this day. Uh, you know, so of the three that we are, movies that we're talking about today, definitely um, the its pedigree is framed by its context, right? The yeah. time in which it came up with you know, whereas I do feel like Ro and 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 uh, Satan slaves are um have the are a bit more timeless, right? Like mm-hmm. five, ten years down the road, I think people will still enjoy watching these films. But for Shutter mm. in particular, and maybe why I chose it, um, out of instinct, perhaps more than mm-hmm. anything else, is because in my mind, as someone who at that point in time was was learning to love the horror genre coming out of the kind of 90s horror that we we got uh, yep. was an important film for me yep. personally and in hindsight doing research uh, you know and reading out about it for you know basically horror in Southeast Asia mm-hmm. definitely you know um, I think the thing that maybe on in terms of technicality and stuff like that like yep. Shutter doesn't stand out and even back then it didn't stand out but yep. where it kind of stood on is you know like it relied on 
the storytelling conventions of J-horror to lull the viewer into thinking that this is a story that they've seen before and yeah. then they kind of subvert them, you know. Yeah. Like, first, the hit-and-run accident as the inciting event, the, the apparent reason that is driving the revenge of this evil spirit, right? Like, it's not the reason. And then, you know, Toon's friends, the very ones that he was celebrating with in the beginning, start committing suicide. So there is a real, like, mystery here that, that, that grips you. Um, and then there is, you know... Um, the, the questioning and then tune you realize he's harboring secrets uh, yep. that, that threatens uh, not just his relationship with Jane but the, the lives of himself and his and his friends you know and then the hauntings escalate you know and the story was very good the traditional ghostly scares uh, perhaps not super ingenious but yep. they work you mm-hmm. know you know they they work on a pure cookie it's pretty cookie cutter but they work and and the ghostly kind of uh, what's her name? Natre, right? Like yeah. makes mm-hmm. her presence known in these professional pictures in the dark room. Um, there's even one very clever bathroom scares that ends oh, yeah. in a bit of comedy. That's, that's, <laughs> that's very well done. Um, there's another late night driving encounter that is very scary. So it, it kind of works, you know. There's so, so much of this uh, bread and butter like horror movie making works, uh, and there's something to be said about that, like, And 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 as with many of the stories of this ilk, you know, like Toon and Jane eventually trace. Uh, that goes back to her hometown to learn the truth about her fate and to ensure that she's laid to rest properly, you know, in the hopes of quelling her unrest, you know. And then that kicks off the significant reveals of Toon's connection to the ghost as well as a climactic showdown, you know. Yeah. Um, but it's really the, the happy ever after false ending uh, <laughs> where the, the show, where the film um, really becomes uh, memorable, you know. Um, it's, it's a final uh, jolt type twist that offers a satisfying conclusion. Uh, justice has been served, uh, etc., etc. You know, from a from a narrative standpoint, it's very different from J horror, despite it relying on J horror tropes. I think, yeah, um, ghosts like Sadako and Kayako, they they were more like supernatural diseases, right? That, yeah. that attack without discrimination. Mm-hmm. Um, in Western horror, you know, like um, in The Conjuring or Exorcist, they're all kind of malevolent without having any good reason to be. They're just yeah. evil because that is in their nature. Yeah, they're chaotic um, evil, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, in, in Thailand, though, the, the belief is that spirits and ghosts are super common. There are, like, so many of them. They're, they're, and often, they're just considered benevolent. They're around, they're watching you. Mm-hmm. Uh, and for them to fuck with you, you must have done something really wicked. And you must have, like, had it coming, right? You know? Um, and I think that's the big difference here with Southeast Asian horror, like dating back to the idea of the Pontiana, right? Like they're all very humanized. They were yeah. wronged in life and they're looking for justice in the afterlife. Uh, and I think that's one of the aspects of uh, Southeast Asian horror that is different from, mm. from Western or even or even other uh, Japanese or Korean horror. Uh, yeah, I mean, those are the, the good points of a movie that I still think stand the test of time. Yeah. But if you're watching it in 2021, uh, you you kind of have to like close one <laughs> eye a bit because it's the same as like when you're watching like action from the eighties, you know. Yeah. Like, it's not it's not the Raid or John Wick anymore. Like uh, you have to take into account, you know, the practical effects back then. Yeah. The, everything was done differently. The style was different. Uh, so yeah, you you just have to keep the context in mind, like, while while you're watching Shutter from a modern perspective. Mm, for sure, for sure. That being yeah. said, right, like it's still a better film than the Hollywood adaptation. Sure. Which had the entire budget of the Hollywood... Okay, the budget for the Hollywood film was twice as much as the original Thai Shutter made at the box office. Mm-hmm. And it was still a terrible film. Yeah, like, mm-hmm. really. I remember that because I went to watch the American one mm-hmm. in cinemas, and it was a waste of time and my money. Yep. Yeah, that is. 100%. Yeah. 100%. There you know, is, like... The, the the American one was like made for eight million dollars. Uh so much more than than this very clearly low budget movie was. Yeah. Uh and, and it had very diminishing returns. It's not even worth watching. I wouldn't recommend that. Yeah, no. Um the, the thing about Shutter is it became like such a hit that like Americans wanted to remake it. There is even a Tamil remake. Uh yeah, uh, yeah it was remade as Sivi, uh and it's in uh, Hindi. Uh and it was uh I think the Tamil title is called Click, uh which is you know, the, interesting. The Hindi like, title I, is Click. The Hindi title is Click. You're yeah, right. Yeah. title. Yep. Yep. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Um. Interesting. Like I, I, I actually didn't realize that he had made such a big cultural impact. Yeah. But it clearly, it clearly did. Like, uh, I think my friends still talk about Shutter, and a lot of it has more to do with like how it scared them yeah. and left the lasting memory. Oh, I yeah. guarantee. 
empathy that I think if all of them rewatched it, they wouldn't feel as fearful anymore. There's something about it, like in that it was the it came at the right time and the right place to just like fuck with us. Yeah, I, I mean, like it, it again, like it was a, a horror film, like of a, a particular time, right? Like and mm-hmm. something that lay, made such a lasting impression that even two like two decades on, you know, we're still mm-hmm. talking about we're still uh, like I mean, like now having rewatched it again, yes, definitely, you know, I've seen more terrifying films, uh, yeah. but man, like. The f- I don't know. I think it will still take me a while having watched it again, right? To unpack what kind of impact it had on a young Isa watching it back then, right? Yep. That lasted for for two decades. Mm-hmm. You know, so just uh, again, right? Like just like it, good horror like lingers for days after you watch it. This one has lingered in in kind of like this faint memory of of terror, you know, two decades on. Yes, yes, you know, like, I think even if you watch other films like um, the the original The, Hill of, the Hills of Eyes or the original Dawn of the Dead or the yeah. original uh, The Exorcist, you know, there's something about it doesn't quite hold up because, you know, techniques have changed, palettes have changed, technology has changed, um, you know, like, I rewatched The Shining and, and The Exorcist just very recently and it just... You know, like something about it is missing, like in a modern context. So yeah. you just have to remember, like you know, when it was made and how it was made. You know, for the time, Shutter was was great. Mm-hmm. It was really great. Like everybody who who watched it enjoyed it. Uh, and yeah, you know, you, you you can. I bet you know. I still have my VCD of Shutter in my house. You know, it's oh, available really? on DVDs Damn. and all of that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, weird things. I don't have a I don't have a VCD player anymore, so I I can't watch it. So you can get it on on VODs and stuff like that. Yes, yeah. you can get uh with Satan Slaves uh or uh, Pengabdi Satan as it's known in, in Indonesia. If you live in America, it's available for streaming on on Shudder, which is a horror dedicated streaming platform mm-hmm. over in the US. It's apparently like like consistently in the top ten over there. It's become a bit of a hit on Shudder, so you wow. can go watch that. Uh, as for Raw, uh, it's available on Netflix. It's yeah. Available. Um, a year, two years after it, it premiered in Indonesia, it's finally available for streaming. Everyone has Netflix, so you can go watch Road now. It's a smooth, like, 90 minutes. It's very easy to watch. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, one of the kind of last things, right? A, a, a yep. kind of weird, strange aside. Um, mm-hmm. Rewatching Shutter reminded me of a really old game called Fatal Frame. Okay. Uh, which is essentially is like your goal is to, like, uh, phot- photo. Uh, take photographs of, of ghosts, oh my god, that is another... I don't know... I, I'm going to go ask a couple of friends, right, who I remember playing the game with and eventually watching Shutter with as well, whether mm-hmm. or not... Because they happened about the same time. I think Fatal Frame was 2001 to 2003 and then Shutter mm-hmm. came out. Whether or not there was a kind of like coalescing of that idea, right, of like capturing ghosts on film um, that heightened, you know, like our kind of memory of it. Interesting. I've I've never played that before. It's yeah, yeah. Like they they were gonna make kind of like a, um, they were gonna make like alt like an AR type thing like a Pokemon Go Fatal Frame. Uh, yeah. I don't know if it got stalled. The last I heard, it was still gonna come out, but that was some time ago. Yeah, but essentially, mm-hmm. like yeah, you you hold your phone up around, um, and there will be a ghost, you know, somewhere that you need to find and take a photo of. Uh, okay. Yeah. Man, that game was hot. that game really, really had a lot of really, really good scares. Interesting. Um, yeah. Um, you know, like to cap it off, since it's Halloween, right? Yes. Like, you're a big horror fan, so am I. Um, off the top of your head, like, what is like maybe your top three favorite horror films of all time? Ooh. Um, I I think Her- Hereditary is definitely still at the top. Yeah. Uh, for yeah. me, um, like hands down, um. Uh, of recent times, I, I think I would have to spend a bit more time to kind of like go back over like top three of all time. But of recent mm-hmm. time, definitely Hereditary, Midsommar. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And the third one, whew, that's kind of a toss up. How, how about how about you? What's your what's your top three? Mm, of all time, of all recent time, yeah. Uh, of all time. Number one, um, it has. I'm I'm going way back here. It's a film from 1963. It's called The Birds. Oh, uh, by by Alfred Hitchcock. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's it's a weird premise. It's about a town attacked by birds. 
Um, it doesn't sound scary until you see the birds attacking. Oh my god! Uh, Fuck, it's, man. Fu- it's uh, fucking frightening. It, yeah. it it really is. I I I became afraid of birds for a bit after this. Um, uh, more recently, um, since you mentioned all the big ones already, uh, yeah. and we've already mentioned the witch and all that, I wanna like kind of shout out the Babadook, which is often Ooh. forgotten. Yeah. yeah. In the in the modern horror renaissance, yeah. I think the Babadook more than Hereditary or the witch or or Mitsuma, or any of the more recent stuff. Yeah. Like, on a pure horror, like, scare factor. Mm-hmm. Um, but the Babadook maybe not be as artistic as those films. But yeah. from pure, like, pure scare factor, the Babadook is it. Uh, and number three, going way back again to 1975, uh, Jaws, which Ooh. is, um, in my opinion, like, the most perfect Steven Spielberg film. Yeah. Um, I don't know. A lot of people don't consider Jaws horror. I think it's horror. It has all yeah. the horror tropes. Yeah. It has all the horror hallmarks, right? For sure. Um, okay, so if you're talking about old stuff, I'm going to say The Shining is definitely up there for me. Uh, yeah. I'm not going to rank them. The Shining, um, what's the other one? The Fly mm. was terrifying to me as a child. First uh, body horror that I've been interested, introduced to. Yeah, and my favorite sci-fi horror, Event Horizon. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, that, yeah. oh my god. I remember the first time watching that. It was like late night TV. Right? Like, I don't know why I was up past my bedtime or whatever. I, I snuck out to watch it. Event Horizon was on. I was like, cool, spaceships, space, ooh. And then, like, oh my god, I had no idea what I got into. But, you know, that stayed in my mind for a very, very long time and eventually became one of my favorite films. Yes, yes. Um, there's this, this is old film called Ragnophobia, which is not oh. a great film. Not a great film. Like, let me tell you, it's not a great film. But it is the one film that scared me the most of all time. I, I took this day, like, like today, I'm like fucking like in my mid-30s, it's been like the 20 plus years since I've seen arachnophobia. Yeah. Like, I still like, you know, there's this one scene where these baby spiders come out from the shower head. You know, oh, like yeah, yeah. Yes. Hundreds of thousands of baby sh- like Like, every time I'm on the shower now, right, I still like turn it away from me, like in case there are baby spiders. Yeah. It's, it's that ingrained in my mind. I, I, there's no other horror film that's, that has lasted with me till now where I still do that. You know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh I, man, I I'm, I'm, it's like it's coming back to me. I, I'm remembering remembering some of that. I remember watching that. I remember watching. Yeah. That. Um, so I Google. I'm, I just Google Ragnophobia. Like apparently it's a fucking comedy horror. Uh, from 1990. I don't even remember the comedy. It still scared me. <laughs> oh, I like I was. I was very. I was very young, like, I don't remember the comedy. I at totally all. kind of understand that, right? Like, uh, yeah. Tremors, for example. When I was a kid, Tremors actually scared me a fair bit. Right, it's mm. only rewatching it like when I was much older in my teens that I was just like, "Oh, this is a joke." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like this is a joke, right? But I still remember very, very clearly being absolutely terrified. Um, mm. Yeah, I mean, on is the topic of, of mm-hmm. go go ahead, sorry. On the topic of like films that a lot of people don't consider horror but uh, should be right up there, Alien. Yeah, Alien. Oh yeah, Alien is definitely horror. Yeah, it's like straight definitely. up horror, but for some reason it rarely gets mentioned, right? Uh, it's more more people consider it sci-fi, but there is sci-fi horror. There's a lot of sci-fi horror. Yeah, the the horror. first ever horror novel ever made, uh, Frankenstein, is sci-fi horror. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so like, you know, horror is much more than, than a lot of th- what we assume a lot of the time, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sorry, you were going to... Uh, what's the other Yeah, thing? yeah. Uh, I was gonna say like like is the is the tremors thing because of like your Dune upbringing? It could be, uh, yeah. it could be right because at that point in time when tremors came out, when did tremors come out? Nineteen nineties, ninety one, ninety two, like that. Nineties, nineties. So I would have been exposed to tremor first before ah. I actually watch um Lynch's Dune. Okay. Yeah. So that might have been it. Um. Species scared me as a kid. I shouldn't have been watching Species at that age. Mm, uh, yeah, mm. but Species scared me. Uh, yeah, yeah. Your, well. pa- your parents probably got like the pirated like VCD or some shit, right? Because that's definitely... It was our thing you won, right? That yeah. Definitely was, right? Yeah, definitely pirated VCD, got my hands on it somewhere. Shouldn't have been watching that. Um, yep. You know, just for the sexual content for sure. But mm-hmm. yeah, I remember that scaring me a fair bit as well. Yes, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, we will be talking um uh, some horror on the next episode of Genre Equality, which is coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh-huh. Uh, not 
not it's more horror comedy because we'll be talking <laughs> about uh what we do in the shadows yeah uh as well as the latest well the first season of marvel's what if uh which ended great we'll be talking about venom let there be carnage um and lots more. I recently watched, you know, Halloween Kills, which is the new sequel to the Halloween franchise. Yep. I'm going to be talking about Injustice. There's a cartoon called Maya and the Free coming out soon. Mm-hmm. Um, plus a bunch of stuff that I watched in South by Southwest earlier this year that is finally hitting DOD. Uh, stuff like The Spine of Night, Endless. Um, I saw we'll be talking about Bright's new yeah. anime film. Um, who would have thought that franchise is still alive? I didn't. Uh, and Violet Evergarden, the movie, and oh, lots yeah. more, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, we will be back though uh, with more episodes of Behold next month uh, where I'm going to be like super indulgent here and I, <laughs> like literally the, top, the topic is like like obscure comedies that I love that's literally the topic yeah. there's no like other unifying theme in this it's just like comedies that no one else has ever seen like especially like not even like critics you know like these are really super obscure comedies that I fucking love uh, and I'm going to get Aisa to talk about them yeah uh, yeah <laughs> Yeah, they'll they'll be back in. Uh, like I guarantee you, never have heard of it. It's probably gonna be our like lowest rated, like podcast. But I just I don't know. I want I want to spotlight these shows yeah. that no one has ever watched. <laughs> no, I mean we do what we want here on the Jordan yeah. Quality Channel. Uh, yeah. ratings ratings be be damned. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I'm down, man. I'm down. I have watched a bit of Lost at Spookies. Uh, that, yeah, yeah. But the rest Ooh. totally unknown. It's gonna be a ride for sure, right? Like. Us having kind of shared like so many recommendations with each other over the mm-hmm. years, you know, I'm I'm very curious to just to see what exactly about these things that you like. <laughs> mm, yes, yes, yeah. And there's a bit of uh, the of, uh, you know like early two thousands like this is my band kind of vibe about wow. these shows. So like, like I almost don't know whether I would like them as much if it caught on to the bandwagon. Right. You know. Right. Okay. There was the, yeah. There was like this early period, uh, like uh, during the COVID, right? For example, where like nobody has heard of that lesson. Mm. Like I watched that lesson like live, beginning episode one, episode two. Yeah. Like this was this was my show, you know. And then suddenly everyone started loving it. And I'm like, is the show really that good? So I don't know. <laughs> it, I I do think it is. Yeah. Uh, but I think as it's gotten more popular, like my opinion of it has also changed a little. So I feel you. I feel you. Yeah, yeah, there's a bit of a hipster vibe with our next uh, episode of Behold. So if it ever does catch on, I don't know whether I would like them as much. But for now, I love them. Uh, yeah. Because they're my shows. <laughs> well, by that time, we've already shouted them out, right? So. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. We were here first. Uh, we were here <laughs> first. Um, Till next time, though. Uh, this has been Hit Zero. I'm Isa. Uh, goodbye, guys. Ciao. No.